Hello friends, uh, I welcome you to the lecture number 22 of the course titled Psychology of Stress, Health and Wellbeing. So, this is the first lecture of module 8. Uh, so, before we talk about today's lecture, uh, let me give you a brief recap of the last lecture that is lecture number 21. So, in the last lecture, we discussed uh, the concept of positive emotion and uh, we try to understand the various functions and values of positive emotions. And in that context, so we uh, discussed that you know the positive emotions are less studied emotion in the sense that you know uh, they were not given much focus as compared to uh, negative emotions historically in the field of psychology. Uh, primarily because uh, positive uh, emotions uh, are you know less distinct, uh, they are less in number and also uh, the, po the negative emotions receive more research att attention primarily because it were, they were uh, negative emotions were associated with psychological disorders and uh, it was related to you know particularly you know uh, human uh, functionings and you know survivals and the disorders. So, the attention was given more particularly because of its you know, uh, importance that was given you know historically. Uh, we have also discussed uh, 10 common positive emotions uh, as discussed by you know uh, one of the researcher Fredrickson and these 10 pos common positive emotions that we experience are joy, gratitude, serenity, interest, hope, pride, amusement, inspiration, awe and love. So, we have discussed all these uh, emotions very briefly and uh, then we have discussed uh, the functions and values of positive emotion uh, particularly by discussing one particular theory proposed by uh, Barbara Fredrickson. Uh, the theory is called as broaden and build theory of positive emotions. In that theory, uh, uh, Professor uh, Fredrickson proposed that you know positive emotion does some various various important functions uh, such as that the positive emotions broadens our thoughts and action, positive emotion undo negative emotion, the effect of negative emotion is cancelled by positive emotions. So, all the negative effect of uh, neg uh, negative emotions in our mind and body can be uh, undone by stimulating positive emotions. Uh, positive emotion also enhances our sense of resilience, positive emotion builds various resources uh, including uh, physical, intellectual, psychological and social resources. Uh, positive emotions also triggers upward spiral uh, you know, uh, in terms of uh, upward developmental sp spiral. So, in terms of one positive consequences can lead to other positive consequences. So, such as positive emotions may stimulate positive thoughts which may stimulate further positive emotions like that it can lead to a uh, upward developmental spiral. Uh, then we have also discussed that positive emotions can protect our health in terms of you know it, ca it can be a protective source for our both physical and mental health. And in the end we have discussed the concept of positivity ratio where we have discussed uh, that uh, particularly professor you know uh, Barbara Fredrickson and her colleague in one of the research they found that you know uh, thus, for psychological well-being and flourishing to happen, a ratio of three positive emotions against one negative emotion uh, was found to be at least important or significant in terms of stimulating positive you know, developmental spiral. So, these are some of the important concepts that we have discussed in the last class. Uh, today, we will discuss uh, or start module 8, uh, where we will address one particular question that is, can we become happier? or what are the sources of pessimism or optimism in this context. So, in this module we will have three lecture on this uh, and we will discuss the various aspects to this question. Uh, today's lecture is lecture number 22 and we will particularly discuss uh, uh, some barriers in terms of enhancing our happiness level uh, and in this context we will discuss two specific barriers. So, one is called as genetic set point and another is called as hedonic adaptation. So, let us see what are these. We will start with genetic set point. So, this question uh, can we become happier is very important and very fundamental question that we all seek to answer in our day to day life. 
uh, either consciously or unconsciously we are kind of seeking to answer this question or at least pursuing this question that constantly we are trying to enhance our sense of happiness and well-being in our life. And uh, thousands of self-help books seems to be talking about various strategies to increase our happiness. Uh, but the question, important question is, is it possible to increase our sense of happiness? Uh, is it meaningful to, meaningful to pursue happiness? So, these are some of the important, this is an important question uh, that is, uh, we will be addressing here. So, research generally shows, you know, um, uh, both optimism and pessimism in response to these questions. Uh, so, we will see uh, some of these factors. So, there are two particular sources of uh, pessimism in this direction of particularly, uh, can we increase our sense of happiness. So, there are two important obstacles to this, uh, our pursuit of happiness. Generally, it shows, uh, it is not, it is difficult to, uh, you know, become happier or increase our present sense of happiness. Some possible reasons are, uh, that is genetic set point and hedonic adaptation. So, let us see what are these two important barriers in terms of enhancing our sense of happiness. So, let us start with the concept of genetic set point. Now, genetic set point basically means our, our gene, genetic composition, you know, uh, you know, defines our characteristics, both physical as well as mental characteristics. So, gene influences, you know, almost every aspects of our life, both physical as well as mental and our genetic composition sets certain limits to our experiences. It limits to our physical characteristics such as how much height you can have, what will be the color of your skin. So, these are set by our, you know, our genetic composition. Similarly, our genetics can set limits to our psychological characteristics including emotions and happiness. So, this is uh, uh, we need to understand. So, genetics continuously is influencing that and setting certain limits to it. You cannot kind of indefinitely expand something primarily because genetics has certain, uh, you know, the composition of our genetics is influencing those things. So, a growing literature has accumulated evidence that, that we all have a baseline level of happiness. So, we all have a certain baseline level around which we experience our emo emotion or sense of happiness. So, you might have seen uh, some people are generally uh, more happier most of the time. So, their baseline level of happiness may be little higher and some people most of the time they are not so happy and uh, they are they are mostly you know experiencing sadness. So, their baseline level may be little lower. So, genetics may influence that baseline level and a research shows that at least in partly this is influenced by our genetics that baseline level. So, our happiness level uh, you know, remains relatively stable because of this set point. So, it remains stable because of this set point. So, so it is not like we, we kind of experience very high or very low. So, at certain uh, limits is set by this genetics and we experience around this baseline level. So, how do you know that there is a uh, genetic set point for happiness? What is the evidences for it? How do uh, the researcher came to these conclusions? So, uh, generally research shows that there is a large heritable, heritability influence for happiness. So, there is an heritable component in terms of uh, heritable component that determines certain level of happiness. So, this heritability is something you know, the people who are doing research in the area of genetic influence, uh, they look into the heritability of, of a particular trait. Now, one particular sample which plays very important role in understanding the role of gene and environment is twin studies. So, uh, the researcher studies twins. So, there are uh, basically two types of twins. So, let us uh, see what are these two types. So, twins uh, are basically can be categorized into two different categories. These are One category is called as identical or monozygotic. Twins and they share 100 percent
So, these are the twins who look exactly same to each other, you know. You might have seen such people, some such twins, that it is very difficult to kind of distinguish among themselves. Ac they look exactly similar physical characteristics and also you know, a lot of mental characteristics. Uh, so, primarily because they share, you know, 100 percent same gene. And other type of twins uh, are called as, you know, non-identical. or fraternal twin, they share about 50 percent gene, just like other siblings. So, they share only 50 percent gene. So, studying uh, twins can uh, give valuable information in terms of influence of gene. Uh, particularly identical twins, because they share exactly same genetic composition. So, if uh, identical twins uh, are studied particularly uh, the identical twins who are reared apart. So, uh, those identical twins who after birth they were separated for some reason and uh, they were you know reared into different family backgrounds and environments. Uh, so, by studying this kind of uh, you know sample we can understand the influence of gene. So, because, because they are reared into different environments. So, environmental influences are very different. And despite environmental differences, if they show certain similarities in their traits, we can say the gene is playing very important role there, because environment is very different. Still they are showing similar characteristics, so the reason has to be genetic influence. So, so twin studies uh, basically showed that identical twins have been found to report more similar level of happiness than fraternal twins. So, fraternal twins uh, are not genetically identical. So, identical twins even though they are reared into, even if they are raised in different households, different you know even you know background, different cultures, uh, their sense of happiness and emotional experience are very similar. So, it clearly indicates if despite differences in the environment where they were raised, uh, they are still showing certain similarities in terms of their experiences of emotions and happiness. So, the gene uh, should play a very important role, because they are genetically identical. So, uh, different studies uh, showed a varying uh, heritability coefficient. So, what is the very heritability of you know gen genetics in terms of happiness? Uh, it uh, different uh, uh, studies showed different uh, heritability coefficients. Uh, it ranged from 0 0.25 to 0 0.55. So, it is like 25 percent to 55 percent. Uh, heritability can be explained, you know, uh, or the variation of happiness or emotional experiences can be explained by uh, genetic influence. So, heritability basically means how much variance of a uh, particular trait in a population can be explained by genetic influence. So, variation of a trait in a population, how much of it is explained by gene, that is the meaning of heritability. So, higher heritability means higher influence of the gene. So, this coefficient is uh, you know, different studies show different uh, strength of coefficient or different uh, coefficient. Uh, some study even shows up to 80 percent uh, can be explained by gene in terms of our emotional experience, but generally it is shown 0 0.25 to 0 0.55, somewhere around 50 percent. So, the overwhelming conclusion of this research is that happiness has a, a large genetic component. So, what is the meaning of this is that you know if genetics can influence very strongly our happiness level. So, we cannot really uh, not do much thing in terms of genetic composition. So, it kinds of sets a limit you cannot you know indefinitely expand this limit. So, genetics will always pull you back to your baseline level of happiness. So, in that sense it is considered as a kind of barrier one of the barrier because genetics is setting certain limits you cannot really go beyond it too much. It will pull you back to that level of happiness level. So, this is in that context it is said as one of the barriers in terms of enhancing our sense of happiness level. So, genetic is influencing that. So, and uh, we cannot really change our genetic composition you know, uh, uh, you know very much. So, we cannot really change because it is given to us.
Now, another uh, concept which is related to genetic influence is uh, personality traits. We have already discussed in uh, some of the past lecture that when we talk about personality traits, we are talking about you know uh, certain enduring uh, you know, characteristics of individuals, relatively consistent patterns of thinking, feeling and acting, which distinguishes one person from another person. So, enduring characteristics of individuals are called as personality traits, by which we can define them, by which we can uh, distinguish them from one person to another person. So, these are called as personality traits, these are relatively stable characteristics. So, personality traits also influences our happiness level and personality traits are influenced by our genetics also uh, very strongly. So, this is how genetics can also be connected to happiness through our personality traits. The research shows subjective well-being or happiness is uh, highly positively connected to one particular trait which is called as extroversion and negatively correlated to uh, another trait which is called as neuroticism. Uh, so, these two traits are basically extroversion basically means extroversion is a trait where you know uh, it is a people high on this trait are basically you know uh, they are very social outgoing they are assertive they are gregarious. So, basically people high on extroversion basically you know that people who are very outgoing, very energetic, they are always you know want to be surrounded by people. So, they prefer to be in the social situations. People who are low in extroversion they are called as introvert basically people who are you know mostly prefer you know to remain relatively uh, alone, they are more into their private world. So, they are not so outgoing and not so gregarious. Uh, so, these are different types of people and there is uh, nothing wrong with it being extrovert or introvert. Uh, people are different, so these are different characteristics. But research generally shows uh, extrovert people are more likely to experience higher level of happiness. Uh, one reason could be you know because of their personal characteristics, they are likely to experience more positive emotions, more fulfilling relationships, social relationships. That, that could indirectly lead to more uh, experiences of, of happiness. Another trait which is which is generally uh, negatively connected with uh, happiness is called as neuroticism. So, neuroticism is a trait uh, which is uh, people high in this trait are they are moody. Um, feel anxiety, worry, fear, guilt etcetera. So, people with high neurotic are basically emotionally little bit unstable, they are not you know this is not a disorder, this is a personal trait. Some people are more emotionally little bit unstable in the sense, uh, they are more moody in terms of their mood sh shifts much more frequently. Uh, they feel more anxiety, worry and sense of fear, guilt. This kind of emotions are much more experienced by people with high neuroticism. Uh, so, generally, uh, so typically because of their high tendency to experience negative emotions, uh, they are likely to experience less happiness. So, this could be some of the reasons. And uh, personality trait has a genetic component. So, our genetics also influences our personality traits. In that sense, genetic may influence personality which in turn may influence our happiness. So, personality trait could be a kind of mediator between uh, gene and our sense of uh, our experiences of happiness. It can explain you know uh, genetic influence. So, some research suggests that genetic influences on extroversion and neuroticism and another characteristics uh, which uh, called as conscientiousness may explain lot of heritability of subjective well being. So, our genetic influence on our personality trait may explain how gene can influence our sense of happiness or emotions. 
So, personality research generally shows that personality traits often predict happiness better than life circumstances. We have seen in uh, some one past lecture where you no know, social demography factor we found that they do not play that strong role. Our life circumstances they do not play a very strong role in terms of our happiness level. Personality traits can actually uh, you know, uh, predict better, uh, predict it is a better predictor of happiness than life circumstances which may also partially explain the stability of our happiness level across time. So, which also explains that happiness level is generally stable. So, uh, primarily uh, through genetics and personality traits uh, can explain this stability. And if it is stable then our sense of you know we cannot really expand it too much because it is limited by our genetic influence and our personality traits. Uh, self report of subjective well being was found to be very stable across 10 year periods uh, for people regardless of their income increased, decreased, or stayed the same. So, again, it shows that you no know, subjective well being or happiness generally remain very stable longitudinally regardless of changes in their life circumstances. This research also indicates support for genetic and, and personality influence. So, this finding suggests that uh, we are uh, disposed to experience certain level of happiness irrespective of our life experiences and uh, this predisposition may be you know enlarged can be explained by genetic and personality factors. So, this stability uh, can be explained using genetics and personality uh, factors. So, this is one of the barriers in that sense. Uh, that we cannot really you know increase our sense of happiness level because it is influenced by genetic set point. So, it kind of limits its level and intensity of experience and our personality characteristics which can also be actually indirectly influenced by our genetics. Now, uh, let us talk about the concept of hedonic adaptation. So, before I talk about the concept of hedonic adaptation, let me ask you a few questions. Do major life events, it could be positive life events or negative life events really affect long term level of happiness. So, if there are some changes in your life events, no, maybe positive changes happened or negative changes happened in your life. Do they really affect in a long term way your happiness level? Do they change your sense of happiness level in a long term way? Next question, can you think of a time when you were very happy because say you are buying say new car or a house when you were very happy, did it last long? So, that happiness was it very lasting kind of happiness? Can you think of a time when you were very sad or basically because of some reason, some negative event, did, the, did your sorrow last long? So, was it really long lasting? So, these are some of the questions that we will try to address here uh, using the concept called hedonic adaptation. Now, hedonic adaptation basically uh, explains you know very similar to genetic set point that our increase uh, there can be change in our sense of happiness level after life events. So, for positive event obviously, we become happier our sense of happiness increases after a positive life event and our sense of happiness decreases when there is some negative life events. So, people experience increase in happiness following positive event and declines after negative events. However, this shift does not last long. So, generally from our experience you might have remember or might remember that you know those changes in our emotional experiences after events, they obviously we experience happiness after a positive event and sorrow we become uh, sad after a negative event, but this both happiness and sadness do not last long. A growing literature has, has shown that individuals become habituated, they become habituated to changes in their lives by a hedonic adaptation. So, this phenomenon of hedo hedonic adaptation explain this why uh, these changes in our emotional experiences once we become happier or once we become sad they do not last long we kind of come back again to our normal uh, emotional or normal level of experience. So, hedonic adaptation is a concept that can explain this. 
Hedonic adaptation cell is a psychological process by which people become accustomed or habituated to a positive or negative stimulus. So, any changes that happens in our life either positive or negative we become habituated to them or we adapt to them. And once we get adapted to them uh, our emotional effects to that stimulus are reduced. So, our intensity of emotion reduces. So, initially we become our em emotional intent intensities are generally very high, but after sometimes we get adapted to them or habituated to them at the psychological level and then we do not experience that uh, intense emotional experiences after death after after that particular event after some time. So, that is the that is called as hedonic adaptation. So, we adapt. So, hedonic adaptation refers to the process by which individual return to their baseline level of happiness after change in life circumstances. So, after changes in life circumstances uh, obviously, there is a change in our emotional experiences, but it is not long lasting we kind of come back to our baseline level which may be set by genetics or other things. So, this process the psychological process is called as hedonic adaptation. This is another reason why uh, many researchers say that we cannot really enhance our sense of happiness too much because of one reason genetic set point and second reason is this we get adapted to the new changes and we again come back to our baseline level of happiness. This is which is called as hedonic adaptation. So, hedonic adaptation is like let us say if I just draw a kind of graph. So, our life is going like this uh, some positive event happens. So, our graph will go like this then uh, we will go sometime like this some negative event happens our happiness level goes down we come back again some positive events our happiness happiness level goes up we come back again it may go down after negative event like this. So, this is how hedonic adaptation kind of forces us to come back to our baseline level of functioning. So, there will be temporary shift then we will come back again. So, it is based on the concept called hedonic treadmill. So, it is more like walking on the treadmill. So, those who know about treadmill you may be walking and running on a treadmill you know. Uh, your steps may be counting in in such a way that you might have you know, you know crossed many kilometers, but actually you are in the same place. So, we are doing so much, but actually overall it is coming back to the same level again. So, that is the meaning of hedonic treadmill. This term was proposed by Brickman and Campbell in 1971. So, in, in the treadmill our feet moves, but we remain stagnant. So, it is more like that. So, our happiness emotional changes happens, but it is temporary we come back to our baseline functioning. So, again hedonic adaptation may be influenced by our personality and genetic set point, but it is more like a psychological process of adaptation. Now, hedonic adaptation does uh, some important functions you know it is very uh, it is important for our survival and it it serves many important functions. What are these important functions? So, uh, one thing is primarily it protects people from potentially dangerous psychological and physiological consequences of prolonged emotional state. So, one thing is that prolonged emotional states are very uh, dangerous and harmful for our system. We have seen that you know in the, in the past lectures where we have seen stressful experiences you know and negative emotions can lead to various physical disease and psychological uh, you know disorders. So, prolonged psychological uh, states both positive and negative emotions particularly negative emotions can be potentially dangerous can have potential dangerous consequence on our system particularly body and mind. So, hedonic adaptation help pro helps us to protect. So, we do not experience for prolonged period we come back to our uh, natural level of emotional experience. So, it kind of protects us from those harmful effects of prolonged emotional consequences. Second is it allows unchanging stimuli to fade into the emotional background, so that changes in the environment receive extra attention. So, if we become too much emotionally attached to some changes, then we will not be able to pay attention to other new changes that are happening, which may be more important in your life. So, it helps us to pay attention to the newer changes in the environment, which are which may be more important. So, once our emotional level goes down or comes back to normal functioning, we are able to pay attention to other things. 
if you become too emotional with certain changes in life, we will be stuck there. So, hedonic adaptation serves that function also. Third important function is that hedonic adaptation allows individual to disengage from goals that are likely to be successful by reducing emotional reaction to them. So, basically it is connected to the earlier point that I have discussed. So, it also helps us to disengage from a particular goal. So, certain emotional events has happened and we get, we may be very stuck with that event because of the emotional reaction. So, by hedonic adaptation this emotional reaction decreases over time and we are able to unstuck from it or kind of disengage from that and engage with some other important goals and events that will be more important for our, you know, for functioning in life. So, in that sense hedonic adaptation uh, serves many important functions. Now, one particular uh, model was proposed by Wilson and Gilbert in 2008 to explain the process of hedonic adaptation, how hedonic adaptation actually happens. This model is called as AREA model, area model of hedonic adaptation. So, basically uh, uh, this model says people engage in the sequential processing of attending which means A, reacting R, explaining E and adapting which means A. So, which basically is A R E A, area model. So, hedonic adaptation happens in a process, sequential process of attending, reacting, explaining and adapting finally, adaptation happens. So, basically this model is saying when something emotionally relevant happens, some event happens, emotionally relevant happens. So, it draws our attention. Obviously, whenever there any, any event happens which is which is an emotional consequence, all our attention goes there. All the attention goes to that event. So, it is associated with our attention. We attend to that and obviously, if it is an emotional event, we react to that event in an emotional way. So, if it is a positive event, we become happier. If it is a negative event, we become sad. So, uh, then we react with some emotions, react with emotions positive or negative. So, the next step is we try to then explain or try to understand why and how of what has happened. So, whatever positive event or negative event, we try to explain it, understand it, why it has happened, how it has happened. So, we try to explain it in our mind. So, that is the explaining part and this explanation plays very important role in adaptation. So, the rate of adaptation will depend on our explanation. So, faster we make sense of the events, the faster will be our adaptation. So, this step uh, explaining determines the rate of adaptation. For example, you did not qualify in a particular interview. So, you may feel very sad and uh, you know sorrowful about that event. Then you will try to understand why this has happened, why I did not qualify in that interview. You will try to make sense of it or maybe other people will try to help you to make sense. So, you may see that okay, I was less qualified and skilled than other participants in the interview. So, that is why I did not qualify. So, you kind of made sense of the event, you try to explain it. Now, you came in terms with it, even though you may feel bad initially, but slowly, slowly you will come back. So, you will adapt to it. Once you explain, then adaptation happens. Then emotional consequences goes down, your sadness level will go down, because now you understand why this has happened. If you are not able to explain it, your emotional level will remain high. So, then adaptation happens. Uh, so, adapt, so, basically we can uh, use this, uh, show this particular model in a diagrammatic way. So, let us say, you know, any event negative or positive event has happened in your life. So, naturally events will, uh, emotional events will attract your attention. You will attend, give attention, obviously it will automatically, you know, draw your attention. Once you attend, uh, you will react, after attention obviously you will react. strong emotional ways
so will uh, experience emotion for some time there is no doubt about it then uh, once after reaction we will try we try to explain or understand basically why and how of what happened uh, Uh, here, you know, um, uh, there may be many uh, psychological processes may go on in explaining phase, it may be assimilation, accommodation, you will uh, try to understand implications, significance. etcetera. So, all these things you can you, you will be part of your explanation. If you are not able to explain properly again the cycle will go on. However, if you are successful in explaining you will adapt. After adaptation there will be no further processing. weak emotional reactions so if it is unsuccessful generally it will again go through all this process so this is uh, uh, in a diagrammatic fashion we can uh, you know explain the process of adaptation that happens. So, after event we attend, after attention we react emotionally and after uh, reacting emotional consequences we generally uh, for some time we try to explain it why and what has happened using you no know, assimilation, you know, accommodation, we will see implications, we will try to understand the significance of the event and if this explanation process is successful we adapt then we do not process too much again uh, and uh, there is not much emotional consequence to it. So, that is the meaning of hedonic adaptation. However, if it is un unsuccessful we may again kind of do this cycle till we become successful in terms of adaptation. So, is hedonic adaptation is same for both positive and negative life events. So, let us see some of the research finding is had adaptation happens at the same rate for both positive event as well as negative event let us see. Now, hedonic adaptation occurs in response to both positive. Generally, we adapt to positive changes in life and negative changes. That is a, a good thing that, that we adapt. Uh, but this adaptation, the rate of adaptation may differ depending on the nature of the event. For example, for negative events, evidences are not very consistent uh, in case of negative events. Some studies shows that, um, you know, individuals only partially adapt to negative events such as divorce widowhood, uh, whereas some studies found that people also adapt to these events also, negative events. So, there is not consistent finding. Some studies shows that people are not completely adapting to negative events. Some negative events such as you know uh, divorce or widowhood and uh, some other studies also shows being disabled. So, these uh, negative events uh, sometimes people are not able to completely adapt to them. They partially adapt to them and it takes more time to adapt to negative events. We, it, it is not easy to adapt to negative event, it takes much more time as compared to positive events. For example, you know one uh, large scale study uh, by Lucas and his colleagues in 2007, they conducted two panel studies, one with 40,000 people living in Germany and the other with 27,000 people in Britain. So, these two panel studies they conducted uh, and they assessed yearly uh, for up to 14 to 21 years, uh, you know, it is the longitudinal data they have collected and they examined this uh, group of people, uh, the, the extent to which these people adapt to various life events such as marriage, widowhood, divorce, unemployment, disability and severe disability. 
So, they try to see various life changes that are happening in their life and how people adapt to these life changes or is the rate of adaptation same for all people, all types of event or types of event also determines the adaptation rate. So, this is a large scale study and a longitudinal study. It is a very important and significant study that indicates some important things. For example, they found that a level of adaptation is not same for all events. People who experienced marriage, widowhood, divorce, adopted and returned to their baseline level of subjective well being. So, generally for events they found like marriage, widowhood, even divorce, people generally adapted and returned to their baseline level, you know, such changes. Uh, emotional consequences for un, you know in response to such changes were not very long lasting and people could adapt to them. So, that was not really problematic. However, they found people who experienced unemployment and disability did not adapt it completely. For events such as unemployment and disability people could not completely adapt to them. So, this was really a lingering thing they were not adapting and they were having negative emotional consequence for a long time. So, they were not able to adapt completely. So, consequences of such events were lingering to them for a long time. So, the adaptation was partial. Further, they found that you know, uh, they found lack of hedonic adaptation for those with a severe disability. People with severe disability, you know, they could not uh, found you know, uh, uh, very strong adaptation you know, evidences for people with severe disability. So, there was no rebound of even after 7 years of the low point following their life altering event. So, even after 7 years they could not find that people with severe disability they could not adapt to their life. It was still causing lot of negative emotional consequences. So, uh, depending on the events, so for negative emotional events people may adapt for most of the negative uh, emotional uh, events and which is good that is why it helps them to survive. But some negative events may have very strong consequences and people may not be able to adapt to them con completely and for some event people may not be able to adapt even at all that is also possible like severe disability. For positive event uh, research generally shows that hedonic adaptation is more complete and faster. For any positive event generally research shows that people adapt to all positive changes in their life you know that uh, happiness or the increase in, in positive emotion dis, did not last, uh, they generally come back almost for all positive uh, changes in human's life and it is much more faster. People quickly adapt to uh, positive, positive changes whereas, in the case of negative emotions people generally takes much more time and it is you know uh, and many cases it is not complete adaptation, but in positive cases adaptation is much more complete as well as faster. So, there is a consistent evidence that people on an average adapt completely to major positive life changes such as getting married, acquiring a new job and even winning lottery. People completely adapt within few months or years of time. So, this may be one of the obstacle in human pursuit of happiness. So, if people completely adapt to positive changes, so happiness level is very short term and people will come back. So, positive emotional consequences may not last long and people generally completely adapt to them. So, this could be one of the another obstacle in uh, experiencing or in terms of enhancing positive emotion or uh, happiness level. So, let us see at the end why adaptation is faster in case of positive changes and it is not it takes much more time in case of negative emotions or negative changes uh, events. So, one researcher uh, Leibomirsky uh, proposed some possible mechanism why adaptation is faster in case of positive changes. One uh, reason is cognitive effects of negative stimuli are stronger than positive stimuli. So, generally negative events has much more impact on our mind. So, the impact and effect is much more stronger. So, it becomes more difficult to come out of it and adapt to it. For example, research shows that negative events and words are twice more likely to be recalled as compared to positive events. So, if somebody says something negative to you and another person says something positive to you, you are more likely to remember the negative things that was said to you. So, any negative comment about yourself will be remembered much more time. So, because it has a much more impact on our mind. 
Second reason, people are more likely to monitor, pay attention, remember and influence by negative feedback than positive feedback. So that is what we said. So if somebody give you a negative feedback about something, you are more likely to pay attention to it, you more likely to remember it for a long time and you will be more influenced by it. So negative has much more impact on you as compared to positive stimuli and feedback. Negative information is stronger than positive information in the first impression, non-verbal message, interpersonal interaction and evaluation category. In various research uh, contexts, it has been found that negative information plays a, has a much more stronger impact in case of let us say first impression. So, whenever you meet somebody let us say for the first time, uh, any negative thing will be remembered much more strongly than some positive things. So, in, in the context of first impression. Uh, negative stimuli or impressions plays become uh, has a much more impact on us. Even in uh, non-verbal communication also some negative indications you know are more likely to have impact even in interpersonal context evaluation categories. So, in various research uh, shows that you know uh, the impact of negative information is much more stronger on us as compared to positive uh, stimuli or information. Last is the impact of everyday negative event is much more powerful and long lasting than positive events. Even in the context of everyday uh, life events that various diary studies have shown that small small negative event that happens in our day to day life has much more impact on us than various positive event that happens in our life. So, overall you can see uh, the negative events or stimuli feedback has much more impact on our mind and our system then positive events. So, when things has much more impact which may have evolutionary reason because we need to pay attention to negative thing for survival and because it has much more impact it is difficult to come out of it, it takes much more time to come out of it and adapt to it. So, that could be some of the reason why uh, we get more adapted to positive events as compared to negative events and adaptation is faster in positive events as compared to negative events. So, uh, uh, with this I will end today's lecture uh, and uh, in the next lecture we will talk about despite these barriers how can we enhance our uh, happiness level. Is it possible to you know have a sustainable happiness? So, this thing we will discuss in the next lecture. Next lecture we will talk about the sources of optimism despite this uh, pessimism how can we increase our happiness level by certain interventions. So, in the last few lecture will uh, in the coming few lectures we will talk about that only. So, with this I will end today's lecture. Thank you.